Hi, welcome to Blessed Hope Forever. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for that access. So grateful for the opportunity that you give us to come together to study your word, to think about it, to meditate on it, to pray about it. I thank you, dear Lord, for all of those who are longing to grow in grace and knowledge of you. We are so aware of just how limited our understanding is. I just pray that you are our one teacher. You would seal truth to our heart, filtering out all of the foolishness, all of the ignorance. And I pray this in Christ's name. Uh, we've been uh, studying together in the uh, first letter of the Corinthians verse by verse. And, and in our last study together, we were closing in on the end of chapter 4. Uh, you remember we spent some time on the my ways of verse 17. And I stress the fact that the Holy Spirit is the author of this epistle. Uh, I keep stressing that because I believe that is so very important. Uh, he's the author. And I stress that because there's so much preaching today, even among those who would uh, agree 100% that this is God's Word, who spend all their time on what Paul's ideas were and what Paul was trying to do. And, and I don't believe Paul had anything to do with what the Holy Spirit wants done with the message of this epistle. It is the Holy Spirit speaking to us as well as the Corinthians. And so we spent some time looking at the my ways there, which are in Christ Jesus, and, and, and that's what the Holy Spirit teaches us. Uh, if you look at verse 18, uh, this is back in chapter 4, verse 18, Now some are puffed up as though I would not come to you. And verse 19, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord will. Paul's activities are under the direction of the Lord. If the Lord will. And, and so his activities are under the Holy Spirit's direction. And so are, are ours. All of our activities are, are also if the Lord wills. In fact, we're told that we should say, you know, if the Lord wills, we'll do this or that, uh, rather than saying, well, we're just going to do it. And, and, and we never stop to realize that our lives and, and our path, uh, our steps are directed by the Lord. And uh, that's important because the person we're fixing to look at, his steps were also directed by the Lord. And will not, will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, pri pri you know, prideful, but the power Verse 20, for the kingdom of God is not in word but in power. And then the last verse, what, what, uh, what do you want? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness? You know, what would you like? Should I come with a rod? Now, you could translate that discipline, which I tend to do, or Paul's authority. Uh, but here I go riding against the wind again. Uh, uh, the word could mean discipline or it could mean authority. Uh, the word means, literally means a rod, a staff, but a, a staff of authority, a scepter, a, a cane of royalty. Paul is an apostle, okay? Now, we know the Holy Spirit always deals gently with us. The word meekness there could also be translated gentleness, uh, humbleness, the Holy Spirit. Dearly beloved, when you think about, when you think about how much He loves us, 
I mean, he could really deal with us harshly. He could really deal with us with a great rod of discipline, but, but he doesn't. And we've seen that despite these uh, uh, believers' uh, carnality. Uh, God has dealt with the Corinthians in gentleness and in love. Uh, we're chastened because we're sons, not because we sin. That's a, that's a, uh, uh, the text is very clear. God chastens every son whom he receives. So I don't care if it, who you are. If you're a Christian, you're being chastened. And no chastening for the present time seems to be uh, joyous. It's not any fun, but, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. We know that from Hebrews. And folks, I'm not opposed to church discipline. Please don't misunderstand me. You know, that is also a clear fact of Scripture. But it's always done in love. And, and so as we begin chapter 5, which I believe, it's just my belief, it's probably the toughest chapter in the whole New Testament, I would love it if you would keep that in mind. Uh, if you remember, this epistle started with a, the grand declaration that, uh, of God's faithfulness toward these believers and, and all that He had done for them. Uh, they had come behind in no gift, no spiritual grace. They had been uh, greatly blessed by the Lord. And that message is also for us. We have come behind in no spiritual grace. And the word is, is grace, charis, not gift, doron. Uh, and so we have God's word. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit. And then we were introduced to the fact that even though all that is true, these believers there at Corinth had factions among them, divisions. Uh, some sided with Paul, some with others. Uh, some boasted of being uh, of Christ, which, which is true you know, of all believers in Christ, you know, uh, you know, could have started the epistle with, you know, seeing that Paul was, was uh, just uh, taking these believers to the woodshed, but he didn't. Uh, it's just the, the grace that we see is amazing. The Holy Spirit begins by pointing out all of the wonderful truths that God has done for them, and that's applies to us as well and they're all true you're a new creation in Christ Jesus you may not live like it you may not always look like it but you are and you've come behind in no spiritual grace what is true of those at Corinth is true of us and all of a sudden the people that have put the scriptures together and they've determined chapter divisions though they're not necessarily inspired uh, I do believe God's sovereignty arranged that that arrangement, but but uh, boy, this is a good place to put one, and they put it there. There's a sudden change in tune, and it's interesting. It's it is reported commonly. Uh, the word says in the King James version, commonly. It's it is actually said many times. It's a it's a present tense. This is something that wasn't a rumor that was kind of whispered around the church at Corinth. You know, this, this, this guy's doing this. You know, uh, it's actually talked about that there is fornication among you and such that is, is not legal even among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. One should have his father's wife, and right away we assume this is his mother. And I don't think it is. Uh, I believe I do believe this is one of the toughest chapters in the entire New Testament. Dearly beloved, why do you suppose he picked on that sin? Clearly, this can't be the only difficulty at the Corinthian church. We've already been introduced to the fact that there are divisions there. You know, some of Paul, some of Apollos there. Uh, you know, jealousies, envyings, strife. Now, folks, I want to be very careful. Uh, is it a greater sin for one to have his father's wife than gossiping, stealing, uh, cheating on your income tax, and you can name you can name a thousand other sins? 
why is the Holy Spirit focusing his attention on this one particular sin? You know, it's easy among Christians to grade sins. You know, some are really bad, and then there's others that, well, they're not so bad. You know, then there's the ones that you commit. You know, well, they're not bad at all. You know, everybody does that, but there's, but there's some really gross sins, and, and, and is this supposed to be a particularly you know, gross sin? Is there some reason that this was picked on? And I think that's something uh, I think you're going to have to work out, but... But it is amazing that here's a group of Christians where this is commonly talked about. The text makes, makes clear it's, it's just common knowledge, and they're talking about it. Just natural to talk about so-and-so having his father's wife. Uh, the Holy Spirit's been very kind here and, and not told us a lot. It's... It's uh, commonly suggested that because it says his father's wife, well, it, it can't be his mother, but uh, stepmother, I guess is what you'd call it. And, uh, but, you know, maybe it is his mother, and, and that sounds even more gross. And, but nobody really knows, folks. There's not enough revelation here from the Holy Spirit to determine that. The normal argument, I'll tell you, that is that you'll find with among the commentators and books and so on, the literature, is that since it says his father's wife and not his mother, then it wasn't his mother, and it wouldn't be unusual for a man to marry a younger woman if his wife died or if he, if he had two or three wives. And then one of, one of his older sons by a, a former wife might become involved with his new wife, and that is the general, generally accepted position. Dearly beloved, I am not going back to law in chapter 5. I can't do that. The general argument, particularly among Christians that have considered law and grace, is, well, God doesn't change. Okay? Uh, so when God said that it was illegal to eat pork, God doesn't change, and so it's still illegal to eat pork. Well, uh, you know it's not illegal to eat pork because Peter we know, uh, was on a, uh, a rooftop and he saw all kinds of uh, unclean animals, unclean by testimony of the law, and he was commanded to rise, kill, and eat. You know, Peter's like, well, I mean, I'll deny you. I'll do this, you know, that, and the other thing, but I'm not going to do that. And the Lord said, call not that unclean which I have, I have cleansed. So God did change. Uh, so you can breathe a sigh of relief now. It's all right for you to, to go eat a, a BLT. I happen to love those things. Uh, however, God says in the law, do not commit adultery. So the idea is, is well, here we ought to, we're back under law. We ought to teach the law. Even though the scriptures declare you are absolutely not under law, but under grace. The word is emphatic about that. And when you teach that emphatically, you are called an antinomian, that is, one who doesn't believe there's any law, that we're not under any law. Uh, folks, I don't do very well on illustrations, but uh, I'm going to try. You and your family, uh, you have a family, you, a husband, wife, children, you live in the United States of America, you live in, in the uh, state of Oklahoma. You're under the laws of LaFleur County. You're under the laws of the state of Oklahoma. You're under the laws of the U.S. government. And you're expected to obey those laws passed by those whom you elected as your representatives. And all of a sudden, you put all your funds together and you, you pack up all your belongings and, and you buy a desert island someplace, I don't know, over you know, in the South Pacific someplace, and there's nobody on it, just you and your family. Are you under United States law? Well, no, you're not. However, there are family regulations. The things that were wrong when you lived in the United States are, are still wrong when you live on that desert island. But if truth be known, 
they are absolutely not under United States law. They are under family law. Now, that may be a poor illustration, but that is what's true of you. You're not under the Old Testament law. You're under a new principle, which is grace. Uh, you're not under the Old Testament law. You're not, though many will argue that you are now uh, professing a freedom that you don't have. Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but, but not all things are expedient. Okay, but all things are lawful. So why then should educated theologian after theologian reach this passage of Scripture and then go back to Old Testament law when law doesn't apply here at all? The law of the believers at Corinth, they are living under the law of Christ, the principle of grace, the principle of Christ, not Old Testament law. They're God's children, but they are not under Old Testament law. Uh, so it is, uh, I believe, a breach of grace to spend a lot of time going back to the law, back to the Old Testament, back to Leviticus, you know, and, and points uh, out scripture after scripture that indicates that what this man is doing is wrong because so because we don't need to do that, is my point, okay? You have the word of the Lord. Flee the fornication, okay? I'm going to put this hopefully up on the screen, which means flee law-keeping, okay? Because you are now married to another, Jesus Christ. Same word that, that occurs here. Uh, the word is porneo. It means filth. Why did God pick this particular sin? That there is fornication among you. Let it not once be named among you. Okay? And we don't have to go back to the Old Testament. God has made it very clear that in our family relationship with Him, this is wrong. To be, to be a spouse to Christ while having an endless affair with the law. I'm talking about legalism here. So I'm not going to spend one second on, on preaching law. It, how we interpret this depends on how we approach it. I don't believe it's fitting. As we look at this passage of Scripture, this is, this is wrong. Why? Because God told us not to do it. Okay? The Old Testament law says don't bear false witness, but God in the New Testament says don't lie. Speak truth with every man. So our law is a law of the family. Okay? Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Uh, it's a law of grace. And the, the fornication is an insult to the spirit of grace. In fact, as we're told in James, it's a law of liberty. Okay? It's, it's still there, but it's not the Old Testament law. I'm not suggesting that you don't study the Old Testament. You know, the marvelous lessons that, there, that are there. And be careful, folks, when you agree with those who say, well, God doesn't change because there are many places where you're going to get held up like, like pork, okay? Uh, I just gave you one illustration. There are many others. You know, if you use vinegar, you're breaking the Old Testament law. Uh, you know, my wife loves using vinegar uh, or yeast when, you know, those of you women out there who love make, baking bread. You know, and we could go on and on and on. So this is not something we spend our time looking at to find out why it's illegal. It is wrong because God says flee fornication and don't let fornication once be named among you. This is in chapter 6. We're not there yet. It is articulated, the fornication, okay? Don't let it once be named among you. So don't miss the spiritual application there, okay? Here in our present context, I have no doubt this is literal, okay? It is, it's common to talk about it. it. It's a present tense. It isn't a rumor that, that, that just got started, you know, that, that something, you know, people talk about and, and they put up with, or they whisper and they gossip about. It was openly talked about. So we still have the question, why this one particular sin? 
God could have chosen any number of sins. There's envy and there's strife. Why aren't those also bad? Is one sin greater than another? Dearly beloved, you, suppose you lived your whole life and only committed one little sin. Let's say you just stole a penny, okay? In order for you to be redeemed, Jesus Christ would have to go to the cross for that penny, okay? If the Lord wills, we will do this or that. So He is directing our steps. It's a, it's a sobering thought. The Lord is dealing with this man, okay? When the Lord's talking to Peter, you know, who, who loves Jesus the most? Who loves me the most? Well, the one forgiven the most. It's a sobering thought. If you never sinned, folks, you'd be very, very proud, okay? And you really wouldn't love Him very much. Think how much God has forgiven you. There are none of us that live very good lives. I stand amazed that God loves me, but He does. And now He picks this one sin, and automatically our fleshly minds want to, want to judge sins, rate them you know, as some worse than others. When we get into the sixth chapter, flee the fornication. He that commits the fornication sins against his own body. So it does seem from God's word that there's something special about this sin. You know, uh, God uses patterns all the time. The word fornication is, is uh, por pornea, it's filth. It's, uh, you know, in the next chapter, we're going to be told that uh, this is a sin against the body. Is that your own body or the body of Christ? And I think the reason this sin was called up here is because as much as gossip can cause a lot of problems in the body of Christ and, and differences of opinion and envyings and so on and so forth, this can really, really, really cause trouble among families, relatives, uh, people, the moral condition in the church. So I believe it's because of that that He's chosen this sin. God has a family, okay? Not that it's a worse sin than any other sin, but it is a sin which has an effect on the whole congregation of a Christian church or fellowship. So it's not named among the Gentiles that a man should have his father's wife. Now I think, this is just my opinion, you don't have to agree with me, I think it's a younger wife of a man whose wife died and he married a younger woman, you know, or he had two, two wives, three wives, and this is a relationship between his son with a woman who was not his, his genetic mother, biological mother. Now that may be the case, and it may not be, but that's what I'm going to suggest. But you are arrogant, you're proud, you haven't mourned, you have not mourned that the one that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. Folks, this is a rough passage of Scripture. Here is someone who cheated you know, on their income tax. Well, do we want him taken away from among us? Think about it. Please, dearly beloved, think about it. Someone who lied, someone who has a violent anger, you know, or I don't know. What sin do you want to pick? I mean, what sin do you want to talk about? Can we conclude from this that any time we have a sinner in our midst, we want him taken away from us? Well, I don't think there'd be any of us left. Or is it the fact that fornication is a sin against the body, and I'm going to put a capital B on that, and, and by the body? I mean the body of Christ in the fellowship of believers. Sure, there's a literal aspect to this, but there's also a spiritual aspect. There's spiritual adultery as well as regular adultery. And immorality creeps in like a cancer. You know, if it's all right for him, it's all right for me. You know, there's no doubt that, that sins of the flesh are, are, are very powerful, but so is law-keeping as a rule or a principle in the Christian's walk. This kind of moral laxity increases in, it seems to me like it does in every generation. And that's what brings a family down. It's what brings a nation down. It'll bring this country down. If you can imagine the ruin that sexual immorality or adultery can cause in your earthly family, 
there is what God calls spiritual adultery that causes ruin in the body of Christ. We will see that when we get to chapter 6. If we get there, you know, Lord, you know, if the Lord tarries, we'll get there. If He doesn't, we won't. Were that uh, I believe that's why this sin was chosen in this context because spiritual fornication affects the whole body of Christ. Okay? Did our sovereign God know that this man would do this? Well, of course He did. Didn't catch Him by surprise. Why did God pick this particular sin? I believe it was to illustrate this vital point. But you haven't deeply mourned. You haven't seriously considered this, that he that has done this might be taken away from among you. There's the influence. He gets away with it. He can do it. Nobody says anything about it. Now bear in mind, this is open discussion, open talking among themselves. I'm not suggesting that there is any way that we as a church should try to seek out the secret lives of, 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 of any of our friends, family members in the Lord, or church members. Uh, you know, we don't have a Gestapo. That's not the point. The text says it is common knowledge, okay? It is... It's a present tense. It's reported over and over and over again that this man's doing this. And nobody's concerned about it. Be taken away from among you. It's an heiress passive. So somebody, something has to happen for him to be taken away. What does it mean to be taken away from among you? Well, I guess most Christians probably read that and think, well, we just throw him out the door. Who's doing this? And, and, it, and everybody knows about it. The elders, well, they say, well, this, this can't be. We can't allow this guy to, to do this. This is awful. This man, he, we can't allow him to be a member of this church. So they strip him of his membership. They toss him out the door. Uh, what does it mean to be taken away from among you? I think it's as simple, as, I believe it's as simple as, as not having fellowship with him. Uh, that's particularly difficult if it's a friend. But for the Christian, it's, it's, uh, is that a bad thing? When people won't go out to eat with you, won't talk about the Scriptures with you, you know, which is what happens when there's no fellowship around the fact that we are under grace, not law. Dearly beloved, Listen to me, please. If the church thinks we are under law, they don't mourn the one having done this. They, 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 they really condone it, okay? Which is exactly what the church was doing when it came to this man who had his father's wife. The spiritual aspect of this physical act is startling, okay? And so based on other scripture and a lot of it, I believe this is what the Holy Spirit wants us to see, or at least I don't want him, I don't think he wants us to miss the spiritual aspect of this. Imagine causing ruin in the body of Christ. There are those who believe, and they believe it very strongly, that he should not be allowed to partake of the Lord's Supper. Well, Pastor Steve, you know, it's really too bad we can't have communion over the Internet. I, yeah, it would be hard. You know, celebrate the Lord's Supper together. I think we do. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Okay? Verse 7. For us, the Passover is done. Not every year as it was for Israel. Therefore, let us, us, keep the feast. 5.8. Not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. What is he saying? Well, following the Passover is a feast. There was a last Passover. Okay, before he was slain, our Lord ate with his disciples, and he said, in short, this bread is my body, which is for you. This cup is the, the, my blood of the New Testament, 
which was shed for you. And so we have the Lord's Supper, or as some call it, communion. And folks, I have no objection to that ordinance. I don't like calling a sacra sacrament. I don't have any objection to that. However, the church seems to have concentrated more on the observance rather than on the meaning rather than on what we are supposed to do, which is keep the feast. Well, what is that feast? We feast on Christ. We feast on the fact that His blood, His death, is our redemption. I do believe we are commanded to commune in the Lord Jesus Christ, to eat His flesh and drink His blood. That sounds horrible. You know, it, it did to those who heard it. They thought, they thought, that's crazy talk. But when you think about it, the only reason we have spiritual life is because Jesus Christ shed His blood and He died in our place. And I'm afraid that many times our observance of the Lord's Supper obscures that fact. And we're making an, an ordinance fulfilling what we should be doing, and that is gathering together to feast upon the person and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not law. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We get to, if we ever got to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we'd read, For we, being many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. And folks, I, so I believe every time we gather together to study His Word, we are partaking of the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I think He's taken away from the fellowship. I don't mean visibly, violently, tossed out the door, thrown away, thrown out into the street, you know, or shot, or, you know, you know or the ushers stand at the door with with Uzis or so, and won't permit him to come in. It's just that they don't have any fellowship with him. If that happens, eventually he'd probably leave the church. I, I think he's delivered to Satan by God for the destruction of the flesh. Flesh, okay? Old man, not physical death. Maybe, I think it's the old man, that his spirit may be saved in the day of Christ Jesus. He's a believer. I think he's a believer. That's what I think. And I do not think that this person here in verse 5 is the same person in verse 13. And we'll talk about that some more. I hope that this helps as somewhat of an introduction uh, to the fifth chapter, which again, I will say is a very, very tough chapter. It's a very tough nut to crack. It's just read the various translations uh, on especially on verse 5, you'll see how varied that they are. Uh, I'm going to suggest, folks, that the Lord loves this person, that He belongs to Him, that He's delivering Him over to Satan. Does that mean that Satan is supposed to kill Him? I don't think so. Now, maybe that is. Maybe that's true. If He does, now He's in heaven and He's way ahead of you, Okay. All right. I don't think that's what it's saying. I do believe there's a, there's a sin unto death. I do believe you can believers can go off and be involved and fulfill the flesh to the point to where that uh, they get in some real trouble. And it may even lead to physical death. But I don't think that's what this is talking about. I think the Lord is dealing lovingly and gently with this person, even if they... they and, and I stress again, this is God's Word. It's not Paul. I do not think it is Paul that is putting this brother outside the door of the church. I don't think that the church is to, to, to toss this guy out on his ear. I don't think that's what the text is saying at all. I think it is the Holy Spirit. This is His Word, not Paul's. Paul is working. The Holy Spirit is working through Paul. And so we're going to talk more about this. I hope this has helped some, uh, and I hope that all of you are well. Rest in Him, dearly beloved. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.